Welcome to the UC San Diego 8th Annual Grad Slam Competition. Grad Slam is a competitive speaking event where graduate students present on the impact of their research and compete for financial prizes at the local and system-wide level. Today's winner will proceed to the UC system-wide Grad Slam competition on May 7th, 2021. Before we begin our event, we would like to start with a land acknowledgement. The UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land and the original people of the area where our campus is located. The university is built on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. Today, the Kumeyaay people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We acknowledge their tremendous contributions to our region and thank them for their stewardship. There are a few items we would like to mention before we begin our event. Closed captioning is available in your YouTube video by clicking the CC symbol. Our hosts today are Dean of the Graduate Division, James Anthony, and Associate Dean Emily Roxworthy. Please welcome Dean Anthony. Welcome to the eighth annual UC San Diego Grad Slam event. Grad Slam is a UC system wide public speaking competition featuring three minute research impact talks delivered by graduate students to a general audience. Now, usually we would be gathering together for this event in a large room with a stage and a live audience of over 200 people. But the need to once again pivot to an online program this year allows us to actually reach a larger audience across the world. We're so glad that you could join us tonight for the premiere of the 2021 Grad Slam final round. Welcome. Graduate students make significant contributions to the UC San Diego community. They contribute to the vitality and advancement of the research mission. And many faculty members see advising graduate students as an essential part of their work. They also advance our teaching mission and they also advance all of the research that is done here on campus. Graduate students help generate, or in many cases, generate themselves cutting edge ideas and technologies that years later become foundational for a field or even a discipline. Case in point, many Nobel laureates and winners of other important prizes, as well as inventors of important new technologies did much of their foundational work that led to those latter major accomplishments actually quite early in their careers, oftentimes as graduate students. So simply put, we can't be a world-class research university without attracting and educating the world's most talented graduate students. So perhaps it's fitting that we are hosting this event during National Graduate Student Appreciation Week when we can recognize, celebrate, and thank our graduate students for the many contributions that they make to our university. We look forward to hearing from the 10 finalists tonight, all of whom have accomplished so much already throughout their research trajectories, and additionally have taken the time to craft and share their inspiring and impactful stories with all of us tonight during Grad Slam. We are grateful for their contributions and for their participation. So now, at this time, I want to introduce our Grad Slam judges. Dr. Carol Padden is Dean of the Division of Social Sciences at UC San Diego. Dean Padden has been on the faculty at UC San Diego in the Department of Communications since 1983, when she earned her PhD from the university's Department of Linguistics. Dr. Padden's areas of research include language emergence, fine language structure, and cultural life in deaf communities. Dr. Padden holds the Sanford I. Berman Chair in Language and Human Communication and in 2010 was awarded the MacArthur Fellowship. In 2014, she was asked to be the Dean in the Division of Social Sciences, where she now leads a dynamic and highly ranked academic division. Professor Doug Bartlett is Associate Vice Chancellor for Marine Sciences at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He received his PhD in microbial molecular biology at the University of Illinois in 1985 
and he joined the faculty at UC San Diego in 1989. Dr. Bartlett's research group at SIO pursues studies of the adaptations that enable deep sea microbes to live at great pressures up to and beyond 17,000 pounds per square inch. Much of this work utilizes the tools of genetics, genomics, and functional genomics. The Bartlett group examines the diversity and activity of microbial life in the deep sea, including within the deepest ocean trenches. Linda Davis is Senior Diversity Officer in the Office of the Vice Chancellor of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion here at UC San Diego, where she is the Administrator for Diversity Activities across the campus community centers and provides executive support for priorities identified and recommended by the Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. She received her bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering and her master's degree in electrical engineering, both from Purdue University. Prior to her role within the VCEDI office, Glinda Davis spent over 14 years in various student development roles in the UC San Diego Jacobs School of Engineering. Dr. Shanigan, Shannon Milligan is the Director of Student Affairs Assessment, Evaluation, and Organizational Development and has been at UC San Diego for almost two years. Prior to this, Dr. Milligan lived in Chicago, where she obtained her PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Now, fun fact about Shannon is that if you search for the words spline spatiotemporal education, she's the first to appear with her dissertation work on the topic. Joseph Smith is a UC San Diego alumnus who obtained his master's degree in CPhil in physics in 1968. He went on to receive his Juris Doctorate from Santa Clara University. He has been involved in life science research consulting and business applications since 1972 and has worked with over 25 medical schools and hospitals. In addition, he has filed or prosecuted over 600 patent applications worldwide. Mr. Smith is presently on the Scientific Advisory Board of Molecular Assemblies, a San Diego startup specializing in enzymatic synthesis of long DNA. He's also the scientific on the Scientific Advisory Board of Aquamark DX, a New York City startup specializing in the analysis of DNA in liquid biopsies for early stage cancer diagnosis. Thank you to our judges for your support. And of course, best of luck with the scoring and selection process this evening. I'd now like to introduce my colleague, Associate Dean Emily Roxworthy, who manages all professional development in the graduate division, and she will introduce tonight's finalists. Thanks, Jim. As Dean Anthony mentioned, this is the eighth annual Grad Slam competition on our campus. And we're excited to continue the tradition of highlighting the research impact of our graduate students in this new virtual way. By participating in Grad Slam, students not only develop public speaking skills, but they learn to articulate the significance of their research and discover how to, to distill complex topics into simple snippets that anyone can understand. These skills will serve them well in their graduate study as well as future endeavors. I'd like to introduce two special guests joining us today who both exemplify the best of Grad Slam. Jeff Hollett is the 2017 UC San Diego Grad Slam champion. Jeff received a PhD in materials science and engineering from UC San Diego. After receiving the UCSD Grad Slam championship, he used his science communication experience to transition away from the bench and moved to Sacramento to join the California Council on Science and Technology as a science policy fellow in the office of a California state senator. He provides technical expertise and scientific literacy on a broad range of issues affecting the lives of Californians. Angela Nicholson Shaw is the 2019 UC San Diego Grad Slam champion. As a sixth year PhD student in biological sciences, Angela investigates mRNAs, the short lived blueprints for everything our cells make. In part because of her experience in Grad Slam, Angela is looking toward a career in science communications to help make complex and cutting edge research accessible and understandable to all. Thank you to Jeff and Angela for joining us. We will hear from them later in the program. At this time, I would like to introduce the 10 finalists that you've all come here to hear from tonight. 
Kevin Reichel, Mohan Gupta, Lisa Liang, Brittany D'Ambrosio, Adrielli Okama Razzini, Alec Kalak, Hale Yazdi, Shujia Liu, Daryl Brown, and Chelsea Chapman. Good luck to each of you. We're about ready to start the competition, but first let's review the logistics of Grad Slam. Each student will present a three minute research talk. Once the student's presentation has ended, the judges will have two to three minutes to score the speaker. Our judge judges will score presenters in the categories of clarity, organization, delivery, visuals, appropriateness, intellectual significance, and engagement. While the judges are tabulating their scores, our MCs will have the opportunity to engage with each speaker. I would like to introduce our first speaker, Kevin Reichel from Bioengineering with the talk, Adaptive Laboratory Evolution, Deciphering Life's Innovation. Evolution made us who we are and it continues to happen all around us. Just think how mind boggling it is that a fish was able to climb out of the water for the first time or that a primate became smart enough to use tools. These are just two examples of how evolution has gotten us to where we are and allowed us to live, talk, and think the way that we do. But it's not always good for us. Evolution among disease-causing life forms presents a constant challenge. The coronavirus is developing new variants which are faster spreading and deadlier, creating an immediate need for us to understand how evolution works. To do so, let's turn to that fish I mentioned earlier. It probably had a fin like the one you see on the left, and it probably lived in an environment in which there wasn't a lot of food in the water, but there was plenty of food on land. The children of this fish will have mutations in their DNA, which might change their fin structure slightly. Some of the fins will be stronger than others, and those are the ones that are able to climb onto the shore better and acquire more food. They will ultimately reproduce more, and then mutations will accumulate such that the fin has transformed into a leg. This is very well suited for an environment in which the food is on land. Now this process takes millions of years and I'd like to graduate a little sooner than that. So instead of fish, I study microbes. We take these cells and we place them in a stressful environment. And then we give them plenty of time and room to grow. After a few weeks, new variants will pop up which will have slightly different strategies for dealing with that stress. Then the best strategy will end up taking over the test tube and then I will get the chance to study it. Now the specific stress that I study is called oxidative stress. This is the chemical attack used by our immune system to fight invaders. It is also elevated in many diseases and is a fundamental problem for all of biology. When we evolved E. coli to handle this stress, it was able to do so four times better. It also altered its metabolism in a way sort of similar to cancer cells. Finally, this strain increased its motility in a sort of flight response. Studying strains like this has three main impacts. One, we learn how evolution works in general, from the fish to the coronavirus. Two, we can harness these specific adaptations to oxidative stress in order to improve cell factories which produce products for us like drugs. And finally, we learn how diseases fight back against us, which will inform antibiotic development and potentially stop the next pandemic. By deciphering life's innovations, we might save our own lives. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks for a fantastic presentation. I learned so much. Um, Want to just ask you some fun questions and uh, get to know you a little bit more on a personal level. So I'm wondering if you could tell us about somebody who you believe has had an impact on your life. Oh man, so many people. Um, let me think. Um, first person that comes to mind is my mom. Um, she sort of inspired my entire career path to bioengineering and everything. Um, and my grandma, who's also watching at home, um, as well as my dad, my entire family, really. Um, and then my partner, Sean, uh, who's here with me right now, and uh, every research mentor I've had. So really, 
yeah just just want to put them all out there <laughs> well i totally understand your your network of personal people is very important to your success so hi to all of them really appreciate everything you've done to help our wonderful scholars succeed. Hey, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, something that maybe most people don't know about you? Hmm. Well, um, during the pandemic, I started uh, drawing on my iPad. So actually all the um, images that you see in the presentation, I, I drew myself. Um, and so that's been a great hobby of mine um, that I haven't really been able to share because I've been inside. Um, they, they were definitely great images. I like the fins turning into legs. It was very, very cool. Uh, maybe, maybe one more question. So tell us, what's your favorite way to, to recharge your batteries? Um, well, I'm a huge fan of yoga. It's another COVID hobby I picked up. Um, and so, you know, this morning I went for a run and did some yoga and that really recharged me, got me ready for this, so. Great, well, it's great having you and congratulations for all of your success so far in Grad Slam. And thanks a lot, Kevin. Thanks a lot, appreciate it. Our next talk is by Mohan Gupta from Psychology, Testing Your Learning Potential. The American education system has a problem. It assumes that students are unique and individual learners. It's true that we're all individuals and all of our brains are unique, like our fingerprints. But despite this uniqueness, we all benefit from the same learning techniques. Now I want you to answer this question. What are the best ways to learn? Take a few seconds and think about it. What answers came to mind? Now I want you to compare your answers with mine. Number one, spacing out your learning. Number two, interleaving types of problems you do and number three, my personal favorite, testing. Actually, I just tested you. You generated an answer to my question and I gave you correct answer feedback. This way of learning is so much more effective than simply rereading the material. In fact, it's up to 100% more effective for learning. And this effect is called the testing effect. On the left, you can see in the light blue bar are items that were restudied. And the medium blue bar are items that were tested. The gap between those two bars, that's the testing effect. This third bar in dark blue, that's a prediction from a model my lab created called the dual memory model. And it's the only computational model that exists to explain the testing effect. And it's based on some simple premises shown in the box on the right. When you first encounter a bit of information, you create a study memory. And when you go to restudy that same information, you strengthen that study memory. When you test yourself, not only do you strengthen that study memory, you create a new test memory. And because we have two memories of the same bit of information, this makes it more likely for us to retrieve it, which produces the testing effect. With this model as a comparison for effect sizes, I was able to accurately ask the question, is testing equitable? Or in other words, when two students walk into a classroom with differing levels of prior knowledge, will testing benefit fit them equally? To test this question, I manipulated participants' initial study memory strength and then saw if testing had differing effects on their learning. And as you can see in this bar graph, the model is able to accurately predict the testing effect regardless of their prior knowledge. This is evidence that testing is a resoundingly efficacious learning tool. This research is fundamental to understanding everybody's learning potential. And we now know there are no such things as learning styles like visual, and tactile learners. They're simply just learners like you and me. There's the saying that you don't know if you don't try. And this is true for memory. If you don't try and retrieve it, you won't know it. Thank you. All right, well done, Mohan. That was fantastic. So from your presentation, we just learned a lot about learning, but how about we learn a little bit more about you? So let's start with something most people don't know about you. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, looking at my uh, head, you wouldn't know I'm actually missing part of my brain. Um, so I have my 3D printed brain when I used to do uh, sexier research with neuroimaging. I'm actually missing this anterior portion of my superior temporal gyrus, which is a, a fun fact about me. 
Wow, that is a fun fact. That that's a, that's a, a unique one for sure. Um, so, can you tell us something about um, tell us about someone who's had an impact on your life? Oh yeah, uh, I'll give one that's not related to research at all. And uh, this is goes back to my high school days. I was really infatuated with the the writer Jack Kerouac, who is uh, the head of the Beat Movement and before the hippies. And he was really uh, inspired my uh, passion for traveling and just kind of <laughs> being on the road quite often. And so I definitely try and take the opportunity when I can to travel during my breaks. Very nice. And I wonder if that's related to something on your bucket list. Does it involve travel or something else? Uh, <laughs> no, that's more about uh, me being an adrenaline junk junkie is I want to base jump one day. Uh, I went skydiving during the pandemic and I really want to base jump in, the, in a squirrel suit. It'll be a lot of fun. In a, in a squirrel suit. All right. I, I would pay to see that. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds awesome. And finally, what is your favorite way to recharge? Uh, my favorite way uh, to recharge is a hobby I picked up uh, when I came to UCSD is actually just making music with friends. I really got into audio engineering and producing. And so, you know, just uh, it's a lot of fun <laughs> just to hang out with some friends and make some music we okay. enjoy listening to. So are you mostly on the producing end or do you also play an instrument or are you a vocalist? Uh, I can very poorly <laughs> play the piano. And after a lot of processing, I can be a vocalist, but my, I'm, very, uh, I'm a very poor singer, for sure. That's great. Well, you're a very interesting person. Thanks for being with us, and congratulations on making it to the finals of Grad Slam. Thank you, Emily. You're welcome. Okay, next we have Lisa Liang from Chemistry and Biochemistry with the talk, Fixing Misprinted RNA Recipes. Have you ever tried to make a cake? To make a delicious cake, first you need a cookbook, and then you print out a copy of your favorite recipe, and then you make the cake following the instructions. Just like making a cake, the cells in our body produces protein molecules by following the instruction of the recipe, which is the RNA, copied from the cookbook, which is the DNA. This is the central dogma of molecular biology. Protein molecules play very important roles in the cells. We don't want an unhealthy protein to mess up the cellular function, just like how we don't want to make a disastrous cake for our friend's birthday party. But unfortunately, sometimes the cells misprint these RNA recipes and that will lead to serious diseases. For example, in muscular dystrophy patient cells, some RNAs have wrong insertions. In hemophilia patient cells, some RNAs have wrong RNA bases. These misprinted RNAs carry wrong genetic information so that the cells would constantly produce abnormal proteins, which simply just lose their function or even worse, be toxic to the cells. How do you make a delicious cake with a misprinted recipe? That's why we want to fix the recipe. My research focuses on engineering and RNA recognizing toolkit to fix the abnormal RNA. The first part of the toolkit would be an RNA recognizing protein, which acts like a hand gripping the target RNA. The second part of the toolkit would either be an RNA degrading enzyme, which acts like a scissor to remove toxic RNAs, or it would be an RNA editing enzyme, which acts like an eraser to correct the wrong RNA bases. My job is to create mutations in the gripping hands to make sure the hand will only target the toxic RNAs but not the normal good RNAs. Each unique hand would recognize a unique toxic RNA sequence, but not the good RNA sequence. Once these toxic RNAs are fixed, the cells can finally produce healthy proteins and the disease could be cured. I really hope that one day my research will be applied in therapeutics so that everyone can be healthy to make yummy cakes and enjoy the cakes they make. Thank you. Fantastic job, Lisa. Thank you. 
So we'd love to get to know you a little bit better too. So how about you tell us about somebody who's had an impact on your life? Um, I would say um, it's Professor Jen Himster. So she's a professor from Emory University, actually. And I uh, happened to went, go to her seminar talk in my first year PhD. I didn't remember what she was talking about about her research, but she mentioned how people always forget about their potentials in achieving something, but just looking up to someone successful and say, hmm, I could never do that. So that was very encouraging, especially um, when I was um, kind of struggling in my first year PhD life with all the stuff happening at the same time, you know, and I follow her Twitter and it encouraged me over time and I gradually build up my confidence. And finally today, I'm in the, on the virtual stage of Grass Slam. That's amazing. It so, sure yeah. is. Yeah, and I'm so glad you had an opportunity to meet this amazing person to inspire you. Um, what's on your bucket list? Um, there's actually a lot in my bucket list. For example, do you know Chinese lion dancing? Um, no, if tell us more. It, so it's, um, it's a traditional um, performance for Chinese people or actually a lot of Asian countries. In, in the um, um, Lunar New Year, people dress in lions and dance as lions to celebrate the New Year. So one of my bucket lists is to play the lion head um, in one performance show because that was physically pretty um, demanding. I have to work out a little bit more to be fit into that. But yeah, I love that. That sounds really, really fun. A great bucket list item. Hey, what's your favorite way to recharge your batteries? Um, I would secretly tell you that I, uh, I would go to a hot shower and I would sing along some songs. I <laughs> just did a little karaoke myself. So yeah, that's my way of recharging. Everybody is an incredible singer in the shower, right? <laughs> True. I agree. So what's one thing maybe people don't know about you? Hmm. Um, I guess people mostly don't, don't know about I love fruits and I eat fruits every day, like a lot. And I like to cut the fruit into very tiny pieces um, with half an hour and eat them <laughs> every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fruit is my guilty pleasure too. And uh, of course, being in California, we have access to some amazing produce and fruit. That's true. Well, listen, congratulations on reaching this uh, finalist stage in Grad Slam. We're so very proud of you. So good job. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Brittany D'Ambrosio from Interdisciplinary Research on Substance Use with the talk, Language Matters, Stigma, and the Opioid Overdose Academ uh, Epidemic. A few years ago, I interned at a substance use treatment facility where I sat in on weekly group therapy sessions. And I remember this one day so clearly. One of the clients who was doing so well in treatment came into group and immediately I could just tell that something was wrong. This client went on to describe how they just lost their job because their employer found out that they've previously used heroin. I started to tear up as I listened to this client describe their experience, their feelings of anger and hurt. They asked, why bother even trying when people will only ever see me as a junkie? I watched how these stereotypes of using terms like junkie and the discrimination of losing your job because of previous substance use significantly impacted this client's treatment progress. The client went on to resume heroin use and eventually they stopped coming to group. Now, this experience made me wanna fight for this client. Not physically, of course, but in the sense of advocating for this client and the many others who've had a similar experience. Now, the opioid overdose epidemic is a significant public health concern. In 2019, there were over 70,000 drug overdose deaths which about 70% involved opioids. And while there are many different treatment options available for opioid use disorders, they're highly underutilized because of stigma. 
Specifically, we see a lot of stigma towards medication treatment, including methadone and buprenorphine, which are considered the gold standard for treating opioid use disorders. Now, when we stigmatize certain treatment options, we actually limit their accessibility to individuals who could really benefit from using them. So in my research, I'm currently examining how stigma towards medication treatment for opioid use disorders influences treatment decisions and outcomes among individuals in recovery. Now through this research, I've learned that stigma manifests at different levels. It can come from laws and policies, from general society, from our family and friends, and sometimes even from within ourselves. I've heard things like how medication treatment is seen as substituting one drug or opioid for another, and that makes people not want to use it. So through my qualitative research, I've learned that education can be a great tool to decrease stigma towards medication treatment, but we also need more education within our treatment workforce, among persons who use opioids, and just our general society. So as I'm focusing my research on how stigma impacts treatment decisions and outcomes, I'm also thinking of ways to intervene on that stigma, which is how can we disseminate the education? Now, by focusing on decreasing stigma, I hope to increase treatment access, utilization, and improve the opioid overdose epidemic. Thank you. Well done, Brittany. That was a really important talk about um, sort of our community. Um, and I wanted to start by asking you sort of about the community that's important to you and sort of someone that's had an impact on you. Yeah, so um, kind of how I mentioned in the beginning, that specific client had a huge impact on my, kind of where I wanted to focus my research in the future. Um, but along with that client in particular, it's been a lot of people, um, it's hard to narrow it down to one, um, but professors starting from my undergrad who kind of got me into this field by giving me experiences outside of the classroom, um, along with my family support and my even my current um, faculty at UCSD and Diego State. So it's been a really good community to have. That's great, that's wonderful. And it's clear that you work very hard at very high intellectual levels. How do you recharge? Um, there's a couple of ways, but I would say one that's been really helpful for me is sometimes just going outside, taking a walk and maybe throwing on a podcast. Um, I'm a big fan of The Office. So I've been listening to The Office Ladies podcast, which kind of, um, it's just a nice way to kind of get outside, but also remember all the funny aspects of the show, so. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good kind of multitasking, it sounds like. Um, so what's on your bucket list? Um, there's definitely a few things. One that's been on there for a while is skydiving. Um, I don't know where I wanna go. There's plenty of places to go skydiving, um, so plenty of options, but another one would be actually visiting all the major league baseball stadiums in the US. So. I've gone to a couple, I'm from the East Coast, so I've gone to a couple over there. I've gone to Petco Park around here, but there's still plenty that I need to go check out. So yeah, it's my top two. That's great. Maybe there's something with graduate and professional students being adrenaline junkies, because we've heard about a few uh, sort of death-defying uh, bucket list items. Um, in addition to what you've already shared, what's something that people might not know about you? Um, so I'll say that a lot of people know that I studied abroad in Denmark in my undergrad because I talk about it any chance I get, but people probably don't know that even though that was back in 2014, I started picking up Duolingo to learn Danish about this past year through quarantine. Nice. How did that go? Um, I won't try and pronounce any words, but it's just fun to kind of learn, so... Uh, it keeps me kind of connected to Denmark, which is fun. Yeah, I can imagine. That's great. Well, keep up the great work you're doing. All of us here at UC San Diego proud. Congratulations on getting to the finals. Thank you. You're welcome. Now we have Adriella Hokama Rosini from Structural Engineering with the talk Aircraft Structural Monitoring. Did you see an airplane cruising the sky today? If you live in San Diego, your answer was probably yes. It could be a commercial flight. The US Air Force 
or even an air cargo flight. No matter the purpose, every single day, there are hundreds of thousands of flights all over the world. Unfortunately, every once in a while, we turn on the news to find out that some catastrophic failure happened. The plane crashed and lives were lost. What if the next air disaster could be prevented? In my PhD research, I'm developing an innovative real-time damage assessment strategy for the wings of an airplane. But how am I doing that? Well, let me give you an example. When you go to the doctor, they collect data from you. They might measure your blood pressure, your temperature, ask for ultrasound scans, or even for blood tests. If you look at the results, they might not make sense to you, but a trained professional can put all this data together and give you a diagnosis. We can do something similar to monitor the structural health by placing sensors in strategic locations of the structure and collecting signals from them. Simple, right? Well, not really. We can't go around damaging an airplane on purpose just to see how the signals would look like under different damage conditions. It would cost millions of dollars to build another one. To overcome that challenge, I have built a computational model from scratch to simulate the wings of an airplane during flight. Our sponsors have validated my model by comparing the computational results with results from the real wings. I have built this I have ran this model thousands of times under different damage and loading conditions to generate data. I'm exploring the results to figure out where exactly are the optimal spots to place the sensors on the wings. In addition, by using state-of-the-art signal processing techniques and machine learning models, I developed my own codes that can gather noisy signals from different sensors across the wing, analyze them, and transform them into a diagnosis, just like the doctors do with their patients. By measuring and processing strain data in real time, my goal is to answer the following questions. Is there damage? Where is it? How large is it? And more importantly, how critical is it to the structure? With these answers, we can help the pilot to make a well-informed decision whether they should interrupt the flight immediately or not. With these answers, we can help reduce time and costs of traditional inspections on the ground, increase safety, and ultimately help avoid disasters. Thank you for listening. So wonderful hearing your talk. I fly very often, even during this pandemic, I've had occasion to fly uh, quite a bit uh, for better or worse. So it's good to know that people like you are doing this kind of research. Thank you. So would you be willing to tell us about somebody who's had a big impact on your life? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There are so many people that has had an impact on my life, but since we're here on Grad Slam today, why not tell, me, tell you about my undergraduate advisor? So he took me to his lab on my first year of undergrad. I really had no idea of what I was doing, but he was still kind enough to take me in and had the patient to teach me and point me on the right direction on things that I should study. And he was really a great mentor, a great person, and he really encouraged me to grab all the opportunities that appeared throughout my undergrad. So when I got the chance to go to France for a year to do one year of my undergrad there, he really encouraged me to go. And he said, oh, the labs is still going to be here when you come back. So just go and study there and learn as much as you can. And when I told him that I wanted to come to the US to do my PhD, he really supported me as well. And he actually introduced me to my current advisor, Professor Mike Todd. So I definitely own a lot to him. <laughs> it's fantastic to have mentors like that, right? Absolutely. <laughs> How do you uh, recharge your batteries? So I spend a lot of my time in front of the computer and I think most of us do. So a nice way I have to recharge is going outdoors, especially in the nature. And last year on the pandemic, I started mountain biking. So that's something I really enjoy doing. And San Diego has some great trails around. So I really like to explore them. <laughs> yeah, that's certainly something I've always wanted to do. I like to hike a lot of those trails and I'm envious of all the mountain bikers as they pass by me with their bells <laughs> and all the ways they let me know that they're coming. So. Um, tell me, uh, what is something that most people don't know about you? 
So some people do know that, but I just spoke about mountain biking, but I actually really love motorcycles as well. So I learned how to ride a dirt bike when I was five years old. And I, both my dad and my brother used to compete on motocross, which is the outdoor circuits with a lot of jumps. So I really bothered my parents to give me a dirt bike. And when I was nine or 10, I think they just ran out of arguments of why I couldn't ride. <laughs> so I got my own motorcycle and I started competing as well. <laughs> It sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Another daredevil uh, among us here. That's fantastic. Yeah. Anything on your bucket list that we should know about? Oh, there's so many things, but I think in the short term, I really want to go to Hawaii. And I mean, you don't really get closer to Hawaii than we are right now in San Diego. So I think I really should enjoy this opportunity while I'm here and get to go there. That sounds great. And while you're on that long flight to Hawaii, you can think about your research while you're uh, <laughs> while you're in the plane. So listen, congratulations on getting this far in the competition. Fantastic research. It's wonderful having you here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Next, we have Alec Kalak from Public Health and Medicine with the talk, Facebook reaction to a COVID-19 vaccine trial on the Navajo Nation. Me and me. Hello, my name is Alec Kalak. I work with Dr. Timothy Mackey on projects that integrate tribal public health and social media. Our group uses big data and machine learning approaches to identify misinformation and understand barriers and facilitators to COVID-19 vaccination among minoritized communities. Today, I'll be sharing my project assessing Facebook engagement with COVID-19 vaccine trial related outreach events. COVID-19 has disproportionately affected Native Americans, largely due to inadequate public health infrastructure, underfunding of the Indian Health Service, and environmental racism. Last year, a large Native American tribe organized two town halls with prominent officials from Operation Warp Speed. In September, the tribe announced that they would participate in a COVID-19 vaccine trial on a patient volunteer basis. This announcement was largely met with mixed reaction due to a perception that the decision to participate was made without sufficient community input. In this social media study, we sought to characterize public comments from town hall viewers using a vaccine hesitancy framework from the World Health Organization. This framework groups sentiment into three categories, contextual influences, individual and group influences, and vaccine or vaccination specific issues. Despite the participation of influential leaders, many viewers expressed skepticism and concerns about safety, including whether Native Americans were being used as quote unquote, guinea pigs. We analyzed over 100 comments that were classified as misinformation. Common themes included references to vaccine efficacy, the pandemic documentary, Dr. Stella Emanuel and America's Frontline Doctors, and conspiracy theories concerning Bill Gates and Dr. Fauci. Some information was specific to Native Americans, but it was unclear to us if these comments were from community members or external parties seeking to fuel vaccine hesitancy. It should also be noted that it is impossible to ascertain Native American identity through a social media analysis. Nonetheless, this information should be concerning for public health professionals. We also analyzed over 500 comments that met criteria for the vaccine hesitancy framework. Common themes here included references to the influence of politics in the vaccine research and development process, providers' trust and personal experience with the Indian Health Service, experiences with biomedical researchers, namely Hava Supai versus Arizona State University, and a largely negative perception of the pharmaceutical industry. Prior related hes hesitancy based on study relevant comments decreased from 62% to 33% between the town halls. Misinformation decreased from 10% to 5%. Our findings suggest that these Facebook town halls have the potential to reach a large audience and complement ongoing public health efforts. However, they risk exposing community members to misinformation and negative attitudes about vaccines. In closing, social media analyses may complement and inform the design and development of targeted public health efforts with Native Americans and other minoritized communities. I'd like to thank my co-authors on this project and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you. That was fascinating, Alec. Thank you. Um, I have to imagine that it's gotta be pretty intense though to do research on a pandemic while you're living through a pandemic. Um, so I'm really curious what you do to recharge your battery. Certainly, um, uh, turn off my phone, turn off my computer, just sit outside and read a book. Um, you know, it often feels like there's this kind of period of hyper productivity. Um, and 
uh, academia and, you know, my free time is not necessarily um, my availability. So I really make sure to disconnect myself uh, from my email and just get outside and just live life. That's great. That's good advice. And balance is so important if you're going to sustain through a PhD or, or an advanced degree and, and uh, continue your research. So that's great. Can you tell us about someone who's had an impact on your life? Sure. Um, I was born and raised in San Diego. And when it was time to apply to college, um, I applied to most of the UC, uh, UC campuses and I was turned away from all of them, um, including UC San Diego. And I had to trade the West Coast for the Sonoran Desert um, at the age of 17. And I went to the University of Arizona. And I was really quick to find a community and a place of support. And I found that in Dr. Tisha Solomon, who is the former director of their Native American Research and Training Center. And she put me in her office, um, gave me a hug and said, you know, welcome, bear down. Um, you know, you have a place here. You have a friend in me. Here's my phone number. Here's my email, anything you need. And, you know, that meant a lot for me um, being, you know, over 500 miles away from home. And the great thing about a mentor is that it's, it's someone who sees potential in you when you don't necessarily see it in yourself. And at that age, I was very closed off um, and she really broke me out of my shell and I'll really be thankful for that. Oh, that's great. I'm glad you had such a role model uh, as a mentor. And I'm glad that we finally had the wisdom here at UC San Diego to, to bring you in as a Triton and you're doing such great work. Yeah, for, uh, for eight years. Eight years. It's a good run. Um, can you tell us something about yourself that most people don't know? That is a, that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll take the easy one. Uh, my last name is a palindrome. Um, it is spelled the same backwards. Um, so while it may be right in front of you, um, you often don't realize it um, unless I point it out. Um, so my little quick fun fact. <laughs> that is, a, and you're absolutely right, because I was studying your last name to make sure that I said it right, and I never noticed it was a palindrome. So you're, you're, you're definitely right on that. And finally, what's something on your bucket list? Well, it's definitely, I don't, I don't seek adrenaline. Um, so no, no skydiving for me. Uh, but for my bucket list, um, I love traveling and I have never been outside of the country um, until 2017 when I spent a week in Taiwan for a research presentation. Um, so I really want to uh, go back um, and explore Asia. Um, I have a really bad peanut allergy, so it was pretty um, threatening for me, um, not um, you know knowing, um, you know, only speaking English. So um, really just travel and uh, at least go to at, at minimum 50 different countries. Uh, so I've, I've been to one <laughs> um, outside of the US, so I have a ways to go. Yeah, very good. It'll be good when we can all be traveling again. Well, congratulations on your research, on your wonderful presentation on making it to the finals of Grad Slam, and good luck to you, Alec. Thank you. You're welcome. Next, we have Hale Yazdi from Psychology with the talk, Why Can't We All Be Friends? Complexities of Childhood Prejudice. When I was three years old, my family moved to a rural city in the South called Commerce, Texas. And it didn't take long for me to realize that my Iranian family didn't exactly blend in with the other families there. This is because early in life, children recognize similarities and differences between themselves and others on a variety of traits like gender and skin tone, and they use this information to categorize people into preferred in-groups and disliked out-groups. This process over time can lead to discrimination against out-group members, which is something that my family experienced. Now, a popular theory in psychology is that children operate on the belief that what's similar to me is good and what's different from me is bad. But almost all of the research in this area comes from Western societies leaving it unknown whether children across the globe develop prejudice in this way. My research takes a more global perspective towards studying childhood prejudice. Take Iran, for instance. Iranian children know that they're very different from Americans and that their country has ongoing tensions with the US, but they also know that the US has high status globally. So how might these children weigh similarity against other factors when deciding who they like? To answer this question, 
I asked children in Iran how much they wanted to be friends with members of four different groups. Iranian children from their own school, so their in-group, Iranian children from a different school, an out-group that differed on one dimension, Arab children, a group who is very similar to them with regards to language, religion, and proximity, but one that they've historically had conflict with, and American children, a group who they're very different from, have current political conflict with, but a group that has high status globally. What I found was that Iranian children express the most desire to be friends with American children. In fact, so much so that they rated them more favorably than their own group. Surprisingly, children also express the desire to trust and be loyal to Americans. On the other hand, Iranian children express the least desire to be friends with Arab children, a group who they perceived as having low status. My findings show that children will in fact welcome friendship with a group who is very different from their own. But it's our responsibility as adults to encourage these friendships and to first teach children that all groups have equal status. Once we do this, we can eliminate prejudice early in life and promote better, more peaceful relations in our country and across borders. My research brings us one step closer to a world where we see one another as equals. Thank you. That's fantastic. So great listening to your talk. Thanks for sharing your research. I'm wondering if you might tell us something most people don't know about you. Um, so this is something that I don't share with a lot of people, but um, I do like adventure. I like to surf. I like to box. I like to travel alone. But the one thing I will not do is I don't want to ride a bike on a busy street. And this takes everyone by surprise because I will not do it. So um, I had put N.A. for that question. <laughs> you know, actually, I don't blame you. I used to ride a bike on busy streets uh, in another city I used to live on. And now I'm terrified of the idea. So good call. I'm wondering if you could uh, maybe tell us what's on your bucket list. Uh, so one thing I do hope to eventually do is um, learn how to successfully grow grapes and make wine. I feel like once I learn how to make my own wine, then I can be the person who writes the tasting notes on the back of wine bottles. And I feel like that'd be such a creative side job. Um, in general, I just wanna learn how to grow any plant to fruition. And I thought I would get better at that during uh, quarantine, but I still have not been very successful. And I have a lot of sticks without leaves on them at this point. I really love that. I've always thought it'd be fun to smash the grapes with my bare feet. It sounds some, something would be really, really fun to do. So um, tell us, what is your favorite way to recharge your batteries? You're obviously a very busy researcher. So um, I, I really do enjoy traveling. I haven't been able to do it much in the last year, but it is my favorite way to uh, step back from my research and gain different perspectives. I like to go to a country and actually spend a lot of time in one country. And um, it's usually how I come across the questions that I decide to pursue for my uh, PhD. I've been very lucky to be able to travel for my research. I do a lot of cross-cultural work in other countries. And so it's always uh, nice to have those fresh perspectives and um, come across questions for later on. Well, certainly in all your travels, you've met a lot of people. Is there anybody who stands out as having an impact on your life that you'd like to mention? So one, one person who's really played a pivotal role in my uh, PhD research and just my life in general is my grandmother. Uh, she lives in Iran and she's faced, um, she's lived through war and revolution and lots of disruption. And she still remains very compassionate and cares for a lot of social issues there. And she introduced me to a lot of those issues and that has really driven a lot of the work that I do now. Um, and she is such a force there. She is the reason I was able to do research in Iran, which is not an easy thing to do. So I fully have to credit her and uh, how prominent she is in the community there for all of this. And she does help me come up with new research questions by telling me about the issues there. She sounds truly inspiring and I'm so glad we have her to thank uh, for so much of what you're accomplishing. So shout out to her. Hey, listen, congratulations on how far you've gotten in the competition. Great research, and it's wonderful to meet you. Thank you so much. 
And now we'll hear from Xiejia Liu from Biological Sciences with the talk, A Key to Opioid Crisis. What are the leading cause of injury-related death in the United States? Not car accident, not plane crash, not gun assault. It is the opioid overdose. Every 10 minutes in the United States alone, there is one person dying because of an opioid overdose. The number of deaths has been rising exponentially over the last two decades, earning its name, the opioid crisis. Opioids naturally found in plants have been used as the most effective painkillers for over 3,000 years. However, their effectiveness brings about a series of side effects, addiction and respiratory depression, the direct cause of death by an opioid overdose. Why are opioids sometimes lifesavers, but sometimes deadly weapons? And what are the keys to solving the life-threatening respiratory depression? The keys underlies in a group of neurons in the brainstem as shown in this red cluster in our mouse brain model. They're also the focus of my thesis research. Just like major hub in the freeway system, these neurons send beautiful connections throughout the brain to regulating lots of behaviors, including breathing. Interestingly, these neurons highly express opioid receptors and upon opioids binding, these neurons are shutting down, decreasing the breathing rate, and eventually leading to respiratory collapse. Can these neurons help us rescue opioid-induced respiratory depression in mice? The answer is yes. Here, I first injected systemic opioids into the mice, which resulted in a long-lasting decrease of the breathing rate. Next, I give the mice some magic pills, which dramatically brought back the breathing rate only in the experimental group in red, but not the control group in blue. You may wonder, what is this magic pill? It's a type of chemical that selectively binds to its receptors, just like a key can open its lock. The lock is also artificially designed so that it only expresses and activates our neuron of interest, the opioid receptor neurons. With this approach, for the first time, we can rescue opioid-induced respiratory depression in awake, freely moving mice to help fight our opioid crisis. Thank you. Wonderful, Shadia. That's so important, your research for the quality of human life. Um, I love it. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. I wanted to start by asking you about someone who's had an impact uh, on your life. Uh, I would say my father. Uh, the reason why I choose biology and scientific research as my lifelong career is because of my dad. He was a biology teacher. And when I was young, every uh, like weekends or holidays, I would go to my father's laboratory and play with a life-sized human skeleton. That was my best friend. And also, um, my father would take uh, me and a group of my friends to uh, field trips, and we will catch uh, uh, crabs or fish or other insects and then play with them in the laboratory. So uh, that uh, experience really instilled the love of nature and science in me and making me wanted to um, focus on biology research. Oh, that's great. I bet your father is very proud of you now. Thank you. I hope he's watching it. So on a lighter note, what's something on your bucket list? Oh, uh, I want to share a crazy one, although not super adrenergic, but also crazy. I want to run a half marathon in Antarctica. So um, <laughs> I was a half marathon runner um, before COVID. I would run multiple half marathons every year. Uh, and I really want to pick it up again. Uh, and also, I really like traveling. I've been to many different countries, but the one I really want to go, the place I really want to go is Antarctica. After reading some books about uh, the adventures and the wildlife in Ant Antarctica when I was in middle school, um, 
And I really think running a half marathon in Antarctica will combine these um, hobbies. And also I probably can win many bets with from people who don't think it will be possible. So <laughs> please make a bet with me. <laughs> That's right. So that's a good point. And I also think that probably running a half marathon is one of the few ways to stay warm in Antarctica. So it's kind of practical. <laughs> exactly. You can basically wear shorts when you run. That's right. Yes, nice. So how do you recharge? Um, I really like um, listening to classical music, in particular symphony. Uh, I grew up with classical music and started playing the piano when I was young. Um, I every time I listen to classical music, I feel like uh, I have to really focus and stay quiet in, under, in order to understand uh, what the musicians are thinking and what the tones and textures of the sounds uh, are. So that calmness really helped me uh, to, to just be myself. And also, uh, when I listen to classical music, I feel like uh, I'm going back to my childhood home as a younger self, no matter where I am and what I do right now. So that is a really great way. And I strongly encourage you guys to check out the San Diego Symphony. We have a really great symphony. That's great. It sounds like you have figured out how to be well-rounded uh, and mindful in so many of your practices, which is essential to being a successful uh, graduate or professional student. So congratulations on all of your successes and especially getting to the finals of Grad Slam. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Now we will hear from Daryl Brown from Electrical and Computer Engineering with the talk, From Singing to Speaking, Making a Brain to Tweet Interface. Communication is an important part of all life on Earth. Speech, in particular, is a fundamental part of the human experience. Now, imagine if you were unable to speak, unable to move, literally trapped in your body, incapable of telling your loved ones how you feel, or even being able to let your doctors know whether or not the medications they're giving you are even working. This is a reality for many people across the globe, and it's what's known as locked-in syndrome. My research seeks to help these individuals to once again share their thoughts. Now, you may ask, how is something like this possible? Well, speech is a motor process. The same way that I move my arms is the same way that I speak, with my brain telling the muscles of my body what to do, similar to a musician playing a cello. Only in the case of a person with locked-in syndrome, musicians still playing, only the strings are missing and no sound can come out. Our strategy is to look at the musician's fingers or more specifically, the brain's activity. However, the human brain is much more complicated than one single musician. It's more like a full-on orchestra. And so we are looking at a much simpler model, birds. Birds are one of the few species on earth capable of learned vocal behavior. And they learn how to sing the same way we learn how to speak from their parents. Now, my typical day, besides for cleaning up bird poop, involves putting these little guys in our lab's custom recording studio simultaneously recording both their vocal performance and their brain's activity. Using this data, we were able to develop an algorithm that can predict not only when, but what the bird is going to sing. Currently, we're working on implementing this into a real-time prosthesis device that can predict and produce the bird's song such that if we were to mute our birds and plant our device, they'll be none the wiser. They will think that our system was then themselves singing. It's a brain to tweet interface, if you will. Now, the lessons we will learn from developing this device will give us insights in how to do something similar in humans with locked in syndrome, but also people with uh, traumatic brain injury or even stroke. And so we place all the tools, algorithm and code online and freely available so that any scientist that wishes to reproduce our work and add to the literature can. Now you may ask again, why would we do this? Well, as engineers, it is our job to make the world a better place. And a world where everyone has a voice is an excellent place to start. And we'll be able to get there as fast as we can with as many hands on deck as possible. So that together, we can work on implementing a device to allow a person with locked in syndrome to once again tell their loved ones, I love you. Thank you so much. Really fascinating research. 
appreciate that you're doing it. I'm wondering if you might tell us something about yourself that most people don't know about. Uh, I, I think it's one thing I can probably say is uh, I, if I, if science doesn't work out, my fallback plan is to be a voice actor. It's something that I've always enjoyed doing. Um, but science, I enjoy just a little bit more. <laughs> Sounds fun, actually. Voice actors, I've always been really amazed by, you know, the people we hear on television or film or in other kinds of recordings. And actually, your research has a little bit to do with that, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, what's on your bucket list? Um, probably, if I, if once COVID has passed, definitely travel. Uh, I, My bucket list, I really want to be able to go to every single continent, including Antarctica. So far, I've only been to South America in Africa, and I briefly was in Europe on a layover too. Uh, I did research in Cameroon for a bit uh, one summer. Uh, so hopefully I can maybe do the, the stereotypical backpack through Europe and maybe even visit Australia. That sounds fun. It sounds like a great pl uh, way you might recharge. Are there other ways you like to recharge your battery? Uh, prior to COVID, I did uh, uh, CrossFit pretty much every other day. Um, post COVID, I like to do lots of walks that start and end at the same location. Uh, I think a lot of people probably pick up the same uh, kind of, of uh, coping mechanism. Absolutely. And luckily out here, you can do a lot of really great walks, right? Yeah, I, had, um, I live in grad housing. So I actually take the, um, the new bridge and walk across, around campus uh, so it's a nice uh, kind of location to just walk and listen to nature and, and kind of deep plug. Good for you. Maybe tell us about somebody or some persons who've been inspirational to you, who've meant something in your life. Yeah, well, I guess kind of like everyone else, I've had a lot of really good mentors, so I've always tried to pay it back from them. But I think relevant to my talk uh, is my grandfather, uh, who was a uh, he was a lot of things during his life. He was an educator, public educator. He was a Korean War veteran. Um, he was also a civil rights advocate and voting rights advocate in the Jim Crow South. Um, but for the entire time that I knew him, he was paraplegic. Um, so I've actually never saw him walk. Um, and so as a kid, my kind of desire to, like, curiosity, like, why can you walk in my, like, in nature, like, wanting to help people, wanting to know, like, can I help him to walk again? kind of initially sparked my interest in the brain and also like engineering and, and neuroengineering. Um, so I'm one of the few people you might meet who's like always known they want to work in neuroengineering. Um, and I kind of credit him for that. Uh, so that's definitely someone who's definitely influenced myself. What an incredible inspiration to, to have in your life. And certainly I could see the connection between having that incredible inspiration and much of the work that you do today. And I'm certainly excited for the way in which you're going to change people's lives in the future. Uh, congratulations for getting this far in the competition and being a finalist. Uh, really great work. Good to meet you. you. It's nice meeting you too. And now we have Chelsea Chapman from Public Health. And her talk is Communication to Rehabilitation, Language to Heal Pain. Name just one experience that connects every human being on this planet. The answer I came up with was pain. Every single person has had experience with pain. In our childhoods, we fall off our bikes and skateboards, skinning our knees. Others are less fortunate and their pain experiences are more complex, chronic, and debilitating. Pain is difficult to endure and should be met with understanding, empathy, and compassion. Within public health, I study communication's role in pain management. My research is focused on the fact that language matters. Language is one of the most powerful tools for improving our health care. Did you know that when doctors say okay three times when we're telling them our troubles, nine times out of ten, we stop volunteering that information and the conversation gets redirected? Or when doctors say you shouldn't worry, patients tend to worry. But when they say, I'm not worried, patients are more calm. Deciphering this impact of even small semantic choices is key to delivering mindful, empathic, and effective care. My dissertation is a longitudinal study 
that follows adults with chronic pain over six weeks of care through their physical therapy. I hypothesize that over an episode of care, physical therapists that engage in empathic communication will form strong bonds with their patients, and this will lead to reductions in pain intensity and increases in pain rehabilitation. My preliminary results identify actual language choices that influence emotion, they alleviate worry and ultimately improve care. One example is called the invitation to upgrade. A patient says that their pain is moderate and they proceed to dial that back with I don't want to be dramatic. I know it could be so much worse. The physical therapist in this case was able to comfort her patient and get her to disclose her actual real pain level by encouraging her to be realistic and validating her, saying her pain was not something to be taken lightly. I study this type of communication because healthcare providers cite poor communication as the most important barrier to pain management. Because pain is an emotional experience that deserves to be met with empathy, and because communication is an understudied non-pharmacological approach to pain management, I have faith in my hypothesis because language matters. Well done, Chelsea. And your research also seems really relevant in terms of empathy and communication and healthcare. So thank you so much for that. Can you start by telling me about someone who's had an impact on your life or, or a few people? It's hard to narrow it to one, I know. Thank you, definitely. I'd like to say that my grandpa has had an enormous impact on my life. For starters, he's always believed in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. And growing up, he was my coach. He taught me how to golf and he was there for every practice and every game I competed in but he also taught me to look at life through a big picture lens. Whenever I was wavering on a decision, he'd ask me questions like, what are my priorities? And how would this decision impact other people in my life? And he brought so much clarity in that way. So I always knew I was making the right decision every time I talked to him. Oh, that's really lovely. I'm really jealous too, because my grandfather tried to teach me to golf uh, when I was young and decided I was a hopeless case. So I'm glad it turned out better for you. <laughs> Can you tell us something um, about yourself that most people might not know? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was a kid, I spent a year of my life in a wheelchair. When I was 12, I had an operation, a surgery on my legs to fix a bone condition that I was born with. And the result of that surgery was one, front of the line passes to Disneyland. That was a nice perk. But uh, also I was able to run and able to be more active. This gave me a whole new lease on life. And because of that, I'm really thankful to orthopedic surgeons and physical therapists, these people who dedicate their lives to helping people recover from pain and regain their function. And that's catapulted quite a bit of my pain research. So I'm thankful to them. And um, even though this is kind of my research origin story, a lot of people don't know where it began. Yeah, that's a great origin story. I can definitely see how that connects to your research. Uh, what's on your bucket list, Chelsea? So uh, on my bucket list, I am a huge sucker for adorable animals. And I've always wanted to participate in this event that's hosted by the Thai Royal Navy. So in Thailand, the Royal Navy, they have this conservation center and this nurture, nursery for baby sea turtles. And what they do is they gather up thousands of these hatchlings and they nurture them for a couple of months until they're less vulnerable to predators. And they release all the baby sea turtles into the Gulf of Thailand once a year. And this is something that civilians can participate in. It's always been at the top of my bucket list. Oh, that's neat. That sounds really cool. Uh, finally, what's a, a way that you recharge your battery? Definitely. So um, to preface this, I'm a quarter Japanese, and there's this Japanese practice called Shinrin-yoku. It directly translates to forest bathing, but it has nothing to do with bathing. It's a practice that has to do with immersing oneself in a natural environment. So it's being in nature and absorbing those benefits. Whenever I've had a really tough week or there's too many deadlines in a row, 
I like to put myself in nature. So at the beach or out in the mountains and I'll hike or bike or go climbing. And this helps recharge my batteries. It makes me calm. It brings me joy. Honestly, I don't think I could do the PhD program without it. Absolutely. And we're in a very good location uh, to take in some wonderful nature. That was one of my recharge strategies in graduate school as well, but I was in Chicago. So a lot of the year, you wouldn't want to go out in nature. So Mm -hmm. it's been a pleasure getting to know you, Chelsea. Congratulations on getting to the finals of Grad Slam. Good luck on all of your future endeavors. Thank you to all of our 2021 Grad Slam finalists. As the judges finalize their score sheets, I would like to welcome Jeff Hollett, UC San Diego Grad Slam champion from 2017, and Angela Nicholson Shaw, Grad Slam champion from 2019. Thank you, Jeff and Angela, for joining us today. Welcome back to Grad Slam. We have a few questions for both of you, and uh, I'll let you fight it out. Well, no, I'll call on one. We'll be civilized about this. <laughs> so how has Grad Slam affected your career and how does it feel to be back? And let's start with Angela. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that Grad Slam has definitely changed my perspective on, um, in my case, uh, science communication um, and the impact that that can have on other people that don't do science. The um, experience has uh, really enabled me to talk to a lot more people about what I do and converse with them on a non-scientific level, which has been um, really rewarding. I really enjoyed um, being able to talk to more people about what I do than just people that are within my field. That's great. Yeah, I can see that. And I love that the impact that you can have on the public. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Jeff, same question. How has Grad Slam affected your career? How does it feel to be back? Um, it feels great to be back. Um, I don't think I would have been able to win if I was competing this year. Very competitive, really, really impressive stuff. Um, and I got to say, Grad Slam has very directly affected my career. Um, after getting my PhD at UCSD, I went on into politics, basically. I became a legislative staffer. Um, and it wasn't something that I thought I would be able to do. You know, it's a very non-traditional career path, um, but the sort of the olive branch or the bridge that I was able to sort of um, offer to people to sort of make the connections between the skills that I had was a video recording that I had of my Grad Slam talk and be like, mm -hmm. hey, no, I'm, I'm a normal human. I can speak to people. I'm not academic in an ivory tower, you know, I can think about how my research affects normal people and can find what's important and has been an incredibly successful tool for, for thinking about how I fit into, into my, into the policy space. That's really cool. So uh, Jeff, heads up, I'll give you first crack at our next question, and then we'll go to Angela. Um, so the next question is, what is the number one thing that you think a winner should take with them to the system-wide event? Because we want to bring the honors back to UC San Diego. Um, I, I, I would say that the things that brought them here. I know when I was competing at the system-wide finals, I thought that, you know, virtually anyone that I competed with at the UCSD level would have been just as competitive at the system-wide level. I mean, the students in the UC system are all excellent, but UCSD, you know, there's a little something special in the air here. <laughs> um, and then the things that, that got you to be successful here are the things that are going to make you successful at the system-wide stage, you know? Think about what's important in your research and why it's interesting to you, and that will be interesting to everyone else as well. Yep. I think that's great advice. Not just confidence, but also just getting up there and being yourself, you know, and you're the expert, the, the world's biggest expert on your subject. And Angela, same question to you. What's the number one thing you think the winner should take with them to the system-wide Grand Slam, Grand Slam event? I think one of the things that can really make a difference is um, trying to approach it almost as a conversation rather than a presentation because when you talk to people, um, if somebody else is in a conversation with you, although in this case it's a one-sided for three minutes at least conversation, you have a much more 
um, natural demeanor, much more natural pace of speaking. And I think that um, thinking of that can really um, change how you deliver the words that you have already written, that you've, you've worked out what you're going to say, but um, delivering that in a conversational style, I think, can, um, can help people uh, understand what you're saying a little bit better. And another thing that I, um, although this won't help you win, I think that appreciating and engaging with all the other people that make it to the finals was so fun. I didn't anticipate um, how much I would interact with the other people. We went out to dinner. We, um, I got to know them a lot better. And although that's probably not going to be the case this year with COVID, um, getting to talk to the other finalists from other schools was really fun. That's great. Yeah, I think you're really onto something in thinking about public speaking as a conversation. And it's certainly more challenging over Zoom, though we've all become quick mm -hmm. experts on this medium. Um, but something's definitely missed without the in-person. And we're going to hopefully get back to that very soon. All right, so our final question is, have you been surprised by how you've used your Grad Slam talk? And I know, Jeff, you sort of touched on this already, but have you been surprised by how you've used your Grad Slam talk since the event? And this time, let's start with Angela. I have used it a lot um, for just talking about my research with friends and family. None of my family has a science background per se, and I'm talking to them about the research that I do I've used a lot of the same language. And I think beyond just um, the language that I use for Grad Slam, the experience of learning how to break down the jargon that is so normal in your field, that skill, um, you spend so much time on it to get to the final level in Grad Slam, multiple rounds, you thought a lot about that kind of jargon. That skill, I feel like grew a lot through my experience with Grad Slam and I use that all the time, all the time when talking to um, other people that aren't familiar with my specific field. That's great. Do you have anything you want to add, Jeff? Yeah, I would just say that um, when I was going through the process, I would kind of roll my eyes when people would refer to it as an elevator pitch. I was like, that, that never actually happens until I have spent multiple elevator rides with actual senators or assembly members or, you know, members of the executive branch here in California being like, oh, I truly have the time to go from the basement to the third floor. They convince you that the most important thing in my life right now is something that you need to, to be aware of. So just sort of really uh, thinking a lot about your audience and the conciseness of the message and how to establish yourself uh, as a credible source very quickly um, were definitely skills that I took away from the Brad Slime exercise. Yep, you're absolutely right. No matter where your career pathway takes you, you're going to be given those elevator pitches all your life. So good to, to polish that up now. Well, thank you both for sharing your advice with our finalists. And thank you for being here with us today, Jeff and Angela. It was really a treat. Thank you. Okay. I am happy to say that our judges have completed their scoring and we are ready to announce our winners. Let me first say thank you to our previous winners who joined us to tell us about the impact of Grad Slam. It's so great to have you back and thank you for making the time. And I'd like to invite all of our finalists and judges to go ahead and turn on their cameras so they can be on screen. So great to see everybody. Thank you so much to all of you, our finalists, for competing in the 2021 Grad Slam event. I, I will tell you, I am absolutely smarter because of this evening and just am in awe of all the research that every single one of you is doing. I think like uh, one of our uh, past winners said, uh, any one of you would be an amazing representative for UC San Diego. You are all that incredible and so proud of every single one of you. So to recognize each of your commitment, each finalist will receive a minimum $500 prize. And we're so thrilled uh, to be able to do that for each of you. All right, I sort of feel like this is the Academy Awards and I'm waiting for the envelopes. If you see me looking to the side, it's because I'm looking at the envelope. I'm going to announce our third place winner 
who is going to receive a $1,500 prize. And our third place winner is, drum roll, Adrielli Hokama Razzini. Congratulations on your third place winning and the $1,500 prize. We're so proud of you. Everyone Thank give you. her a, a hand. Thank you, Anthony. Okay. Congratulations. I'm now going to announce our second place winner. And our second place winner will receive a $3,000 prize. Our second place winner is Daryl Brown. Congratulations, Daryl. Uh, thank you. <laughs> All right, now our first place winner. Our first place winner will receive a $5,000 prize and will go on to represent UC San Diego at the UC system-wide event on May 7th at 9.30 in the morning. So here we go. Our first place prize goes to Hale Yazdi. Congratulations. Wow, thank you. I did, was not expecting that. <laughs> well, we are so proud of our top three finishers. Frankly, we're proud of every one of you. Uh, you represent UC San Diego well. You represent yourself well. You all represent your mentors and every person we heard about you who inspired, we heard from you who inspired you over the course of your career thus far. Truly, truly amazing. I wanna thank our Grad Slam judges. We would not be able to do this without you. Thank you for all of your efforts and your wonderful input in this process. Thank you also to our audience, to the family, to the friends, to the colleagues who really have lifted up every one of these scholars who we've met this evening. Without all of you, as I think we heard from many of them, without all of you, they wouldn't be who they are and where they are. So thank you to all of you. And thank you everybody for joining us for the 2021 UC San Diego Grad Slam event. We hope you will watch the UC, UC system-wide Grad Slam event. Again, it's on May 7th at 9.30 in the morning. We'll make sure we advertise it widely and broadly on all the websites and on all the social media feeds. We'd love to have you there to cheer on our Grad Slam champion. So good evening. Thank you for a fantastic event and we hope you are well.